history tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in Central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spectacular people. Welcome to this 15th episode of the History Goes Bump podcast. Ghost tours for the theater of the mind. I am your host, Diane. And this is Denise. And we are back from our very fun trip up to St. Augustine, Florida. We had a fabulous time. This evening, we are going to share some of the highlights from the ghost tour that we took there and also some of the highlights of our trip just in general. We're going to focus on a key area of St. Augustine since anybody who's familiar with that city and knowing that it claims to be one of the most haunted cities in America, pretty much every building in the place is haunted. So we have to kind of pick and choose what we're going to focus on. Focus on. So we'll be focusing on a specific area this evening. So that means that since we need to do the whole city, eventually we get to go back again and again and again. Exactly. And since it is one of our favorite cities, I don't think we're going to have a problem doing that. I don't think so. <laughs> Before we get into that, we want to make sure you check out our website at historygoesbump.com. We've got all of our archive shows up there. You can sign up for the newsletter, which is free. You also can check out the Emporium. Maybe you need to pick up something for Christmas. If you'd like to donate to the show, you can check out our Spooktacular Crew tab. It also has where you can find all the different locations to listen to the show and also how you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook and Tumblr and all that good stuff. Also, if you would like to send us some feedback, Feedback about the show, maybe a particular uh, event or place that we've focused on, you can send us that at historygoesbump at gmail.com. And I wanted to give a shout out to Jane Mainly Pittock over on Twitter. Thank you so much for your wonderful comments that you sent our way. It was uh, It's always nice when you go over to Twitter and you see that somebody has mentioned you and tweeted it out because anybody who's following them sees that. And it's just really cool when somebody does that for you. It is great. I love having the interactions with the different people and our listeners. And the neat thing about uh, Jane is that she is an expert in M.R. James. And anybody who knows the horror genre, you know M.R. James. This guy, I think, is only second to Edgar Allan Poe when it comes to horror writing. And so if you want to follow her on Twitter and check out a lot of the things that she's doing in regards to him and other activities, she's got a lot of poetry and other writing. She's at J Main Pid, and that's J M A I N P I D D. And we just want to thank all of you who've been interacting with us over on the fan page at Facebook. We appreciate all of the likes and the comments that you've been sending our way as well. And we also got a suggestion for something that I posted. Uh, one of the things I like to do on our fan page is to post this day in history and we had a particular day that I posted something and a suggestion was made that maybe we should do a show on that so coming up in the future we might be doing a show on a particular person who is uh, very well known in the music world oh that would be very cool it's a mystery to me everybody so I can't wait (laughs) pretty much every show is a mystery to Denise she just sits over there and looks cute and does whatever (laughs) <laughs> gives us her snide comments. Snide? Your okay. wonderful comments that we just adore. I'm so sweet. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get this show going. Welcome to this moment in Oddity History. Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh, Scotland, has a school of textiles and design. The school was experimenting in the development of new and different kinds of fabric, and they came up with a very unique and strangely scented fabric. Their new fabric carries a permanent odor of whiskey, and not any old whiskey either. The scent is that of Johnny Walker Black Label Whiskey. The scent has been dubbed Aqua Alba. The technique used to make the fabric is known as micro-encapsulation technology, which layers the scent into the fabric. The fabric was developed for textile company Harris Tweed Hebrides and distiller Diageo's Johnny Walker Black Label brand. And the school's business development manager, Jim McVie, said, quote, Smart textiles are a fast-developing sector that offers enormous potential. Our year-long collaboration with Harris Tweed Hebrides is a great example of the ways in which we can help Scottish textile companies to develop their business. 
add value to their textiles, and bring exciting new products to market. End quote. We're not sure what Harris Tweet Hebrides or Johnny Walker plans to do with the fabric, but we sure hope they don't plan to upholster vehicles. Trying to explain to the officer that it's just your fashionably upholstered seat that is drunk would be quite odd. This history podcast is haunted. This day in history. Today's moment in history is a tale of a wonderful love story. On this day, December 11th in 1936, King Edward VIII publicly abdicates the throne to his younger brother, George. King Edward had taken over the throne on January 20th, 1936, after the death of his father. The king was a bachelor at 42, but he had his sights set on marrying an American girl he had fallen in love with named Wallace Simpson. There was a problem, though. Miss Simpson had already been married twice before, with her most recent divorce still pending. King Edward tried to convince the Church of England, his family, and politicians that it would be okay for him to marry Miss Simpson, but he received no support. He was informed that the only way he would be allowed to marry her would be to give up the crown. And that is just what King Edward did. In a speech on December 11th, King Edward said, quote, You all know the reasons which have impelled me to renounce the throne, but I want you to understand that in making up my mind, I did not forget the country or the empire which, as Prince of Wales and lately as King, I have for 25 years tried to serve. But you must believe me when I tell you that I have found it impossible to carry the heavy burden of responsibility and to discharge my duties as king as I would wish to do without the help and support of the woman I love. And I want you to know that the decision I have made has been mine and mine alone. This was a thing I had to judge entirely for myself. The other person most nearly concerned has tried to the last to persuade me to take a different course. I have made this the most serious decision of my life only upon the single thought of what would, in the end, be best for all. End quote. The king's brother George bestowed the title Duke of Windsor on Edward, and Edward and Wallace lived happily until his death in 1972. You're listening to History Goes Bump. History Goes Bump traveled to one of our favorite cities in America, which just happens to be the oldest city in America, St. Augustine, Florida. We were in town for two events. One was the annual Night of Lights, and the other was the Ghostly Encounter Ghost Tour hosted by Ancient City Tours. Night of Lights in St. Augustine begins in November and runs through February every year and has been voted several times as one of the best holiday light displays in the country. It truly is beautiful as white lights line the main drags and illuminate the many historic buildings that make this city so wonderful. The tradition of using white light bulbs traces back to the Spanish tradition of placing white candles in the windows during the holidays. Our advice if you decide to see this in the future is to do your own walking tour. Trolleys are overloaded with people and waits are long, plus we didn't see any of them stop for photo opportunities. And definitely the lines that we saw, I was looking at them and saying, holy cow, what is no, this thank for? You. And we realized coming right up to that tram, it, I, I've seen shorter lines at Space Mountain during the I holidays. I was just going to say, I've seen shorter lines getting on a ride at the Disney parks. It was insane. And, uh, you know, as Denise pointed out, those trolleys didn't stop for photos. So unless you were planning on walking later, I mean, there's no way you can take a picture of lights. They would just be streaks which in a haunted city might be kind of cool, but... You call them ghostly streaks, and they <laughs> called them the streak. <laughs> the ghosts were streaking. Which, speaking of that song, Diane didn't know that was a real song one night. I started singing it, so I had to find it and play it for her. She was impressed. Which song was that again? They call it the, They call him the streak. Oh, that's right. So, coming back to St. Augustine, um, if you go to our website, you will see we have posted some pictures of the lights, but... Even though they're fantastic pictures, they don't do it justice of actually being there. And this is up on the blog. So you either have to go to historygoesbump.blogspot.com, or if you're at the website, we have the tab that says blog on it. You just click on that, and then you go to the show notes for tonight, and you'll see any of the pictures that we mentioned this evening. Of course, no trip to St. Augustine is complete without what, Denise? A ghost tour. Of course. And every time we have gone to St. Augustine, we have made sure to include a tour 
in our trip, and the city offers a bunch of them. Uh, all you have to do is walk down St. George Street, and you'll see probably at least 10 different advertisements, and that's not all of them that, it o- that are offered in the city. That's just the ones that are right on that street. Well, and the cool thing about this one is this really wasn't going to be a ghost tour visit to St. Augustine because um, I'd wanted to try out Anastasia State Park camping. That's our other passion that we do. But um, we would have little Rafiki with us, and we don't like to leave her in the camper for long periods. So I simply went online and put in dog-friendly ghost tour, St. Augustine, Florida, and we did find one that allows your furry furry family to come along with you. So Rafiki also got to do her first ghost tour. And the nice thing is, if you have babies, we did have a baby on the tour with us as well. As most people know, dogs or animals and children usually are the first to get some kind of a feeling when it comes to the spectral visitors. And uh, we got none of that from either one of them. They both seemed completely bored during the entire tour. So... Rafiki wasn't as bored. She made lots of friends, got lots of kisses. I think everybody on the tour almost petted her at some point. Yeah, we ended up getting, since Rafiki's about, she's 12 years old. Yeah, 12 So and she's a half. geriatric. She can't walk as much as we do. And we always would end up carrying her. And for our other dog, we'd had this backpack that you could put them into and it was really nice, and it was made specifically for dogs. Well, we've never been able to find it again because ours, we wore it out, and it fell apart eventually. So we ended up going to Walmart and just buying a backpacking backpack, and we managed to stuff enough stuff in it that she wasn't, like, totally buried in it. And so she was up at everybody's level, and she was having a great time because literally everybody who walked by had to pet her. So she had a good time on the tour, yeah. Yeah, she did. That might be why she looked bored because she was just you know, had so many pets that it was leaving her in a comatose state. Well, you did say that the one, several people when we walked by said that dog's just chilling. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, she just kind of kicks back and there you go. So the tour that we did this time was with Ancient City Tours. And specifically the name of the tour was A Ghostly Encounter. So if you, if you look up A Ghostly Encounter, I think it's .com. I do have links and stuff up in the show notes. You'll be able to find it. But the the name of the tour company is Ancient City Tours, and I think that's because they do more than just ghost tours. And this was the third one that we've done in the city, and we've enjoyed all of them. So I don't know that there's one specifically that we would say, you have to do that one. All of them have been excellent. We've had great tour guides. They all dress up. Since St. Augustine is full of so many haunts, as I mentioned earlier, we thought it'd be best for this podcast to focus on a specific area of St. Augustine. And that area this evening is going to be the area just outside the city gate. So that's why this podcast has been entitled Outside the Gate. To begin, we want to remind everybody about a little history. We did cover this in podcast episode number one. So for those of you who've been keeping up with all of the podcasts, this will be a little bit of a repeat for you. But we want to explain, especially for those who are new to the show, some of the beginnings of St. Augustine. City was founded in 1565, making it one of the oldest cities in both North and South America. It is America's oldest city. City took its name from the day upon which the city was founded by Pedro Menendez de Avies, the Festival of San Augustine. The city was originally founded to protect the Spanish trade route, and the Castillo de San Marco was built to help facilitate defense with a small city cropping up nearby. The city of St. Augustine had been established for 150 years before walls were built to protect it from the continuous onslaught it endured from pirate attacks. That's one of the really cool things I love about St. Augustine is like, there's always things, but there really were pirates in St. Augustine. So like when you watch movies with pirates, I mean, they ran those city streets quite often. They were running them the night we were there. As a matter of fact, we are going to be playing some audio clips from our tour, which I will apologize now for the quality because it was extremely loud. The city was crowded. People were partying, having a good time. There were people dressed up. I think they were doing, first of all, they had a parade earlier in the day for their Christmas parade. And then we noticed there were people in colonial dress. There were people dressed up for the Revolutionary War. There were pirates. I mean, everything was in the city. And there seemed like there was some kind of encampment off to the side. So I don't know if they had some reenactments with the British attacking the fort or what all, but there were all kinds of individuals there. So and, we saw pirates that evening as well. Yeah, and the divas had converged on the city because they also were doing the diva race the next day. That's right. That's right. So there's a lot of women so lot in of town for as a well. half marathon. Okay, where was I? You were talking about what the walls were built 
to protect against. Oh, yes. Pirate attacks. Also, British attacks and various other attacks. The final attack that caused the city to make the decision to enclose itself behind walls was an English attack in 1702 led by Governor James Moore. The old city was looted and burned as Governor Moore and his men tried to take the Castillo de San Marco, where the 1,500 residents of St. Augustine were hiding. He was unsuccessful in taking the fort, but the city was utterly destroyed. Construction on the wall began in 1704, and it was made from earth and palmetto logs. The wall stretched west from the Castillo along the northern side of the city all the way to the San Sebastian River. This was named the Kubo Line. A second wall was built running south down the west side of the city, and it was named the Rosario Line. I like how you threw Rosario. I was working on my R's because I'm going to learn how to speak (laughs) Spanish. (laughs) Readouts were placed along the wall for fortification and for placement of artillery. The word readout means a place of retreat and is entirely encircled, providing protection from all directions. To give everyone an idea of what it looks like, there is an illustration on, is it our website or our blog spot? Our blog. Okay, so there's a website, no, (laughs) <laughs> There's a picture on our blog. Yeah, and the reason why I did that is because, did you know what a readout was? A readout is a place to retreat. <laughs> Before you read the research we did, did you know? No, but I was just telling you. It's, it's on my screen. <laughs> well, I had no clue, so I had to look it up because I'm like, what is that? And there actually is one that's in the city. They reconstructed it. I know that we've seen everything that's down there, so we've seen this. Probably several times, but I don't remember it. But they did rebuild one of them. It basically looks almost like a castle turret without the roof on top of it, is what I'm thinking. And it's got windows coming out of every side. So it's basically kind of a watchtower, is what I would think of it to be like. So you could shoot from there, you could watch from there, what have you. The walls worked, and the city was never again taken or destroyed by force. Since the walls were wood, they had to be replaced frequently. Today, a portion of the wall has been reconstructed to give visitors an idea of what they looked like in the past. The Kubo line contained the main city gates. The old city gate was originally constructed in 1808 and made from coquina, a concrete-like substance infused with shells that was quarried from nearby Anastasia Island. And we do have a picture for those of you who have not seen coquina so that you can see what that looks like. And I think we've taken this outside of the fort, actually. Well, I believe the entire fort is made of coquina. It is. And the really cool thing is, first of all, uh, Anastasia Island is where we stayed. We camped there. It's a very neat island. And as we were leaving it, I looked over to the left and went, oh, there's the quarry. So next time we go, we're going to stop and go look at the quarry that they would gotten the coquina from. So I was all bummed because I'm like, oh, crap, there was a historical site and we totally missed it. Well, and the cool thing about coquina, because it is the sand with the shells, but when it's in the ground, like underneath the ground, it's very easy to mine because it's softer. And the way it naturally goes is, is how you can cut it, how it how it cuts. And so they would pull these slabs out that, that kind of had a natural cut to them. But when it hits the air, it hardens like concrete. And so it makes a very, very strong wall. So it was a great thing for them to try to quarry in order to build everything. And what was it strong enough to do? Do you remember? Oh, it can take bullets cannonballs like it's that, amazing that was the key thing it could a cannonball would hit the thing and it would kind of i imagine it's like when you punch a pillow and your fist goes into the pillow and it just kind of stays there and and kind of dents it in that's a cannonball on coquina to give you an idea of how strong this stuff is <laughs> that's a shirt in the making for the old fort <laughs> cannonballs on coquina or something <laughs> the old city gate stands to this day minus the actual gates at the northern end of St. George Street, which travels through the heart of the shopping district. Oh, yeah. And the old city. I'm going to pause right here. The shopping district, if you don't even want to just go to St. Augustine for the history, for all the cool stuff, for the ghost tours, the shops that they have there are just amazing. There's all the little different specialty shops. There's handmade shops. There's shops that would be expensive, some that are more reasonable. It's just it's just amazing. Yes, there are plenty of places to spend your money. Right, Denise? Yes, and there's the French fry place. That was awesome. Actually, I do have to say that was pretty damn good. (laughs) French fry heaven, if you're ever there. Yeah. It was yummy. Yeah, and it was just all they sold were different kinds of French fries. 
They even had tables for their little French fry cones. I'm surprised. I, I don't mean to get political, but I'm surprised the government hasn't shut it down. <laughs> so I'm sure it's horrible, horrible for you. What? Sour cream, ranch dressing on deep fried fries? But he said they weren't that greasy because how the machine did it. So, yeah. I think we had bacon on ours, too. Yeah, bacon. Because we had the loaded baked potato fries. Anyway, that was a little bit of a squirrel moment, so we'll bring it on back. The gate has two 24-and-a-half-foot-high square towers on each side and once featured a bridge that went over a moat that used to be around the city walls. Again, on our blog, we do have a picture of how it appeared about 50 years after it was built. Yeah, it was really cool. I found this uh, website that had all of these old pictures of the city wall and how it had changed through the years. And it's just really neat to see that because obviously it's a lot different now. And when you look behind the city gates there, Denise, you could see how much the city has changed. There's like barely any buildings back behind that gate. And now those are just stores and hotels and all kinds of stuff. Absolutely. The Old City Gate is the scene for our first haunting. And before I do that, I thought I would intersperse some of the clips that we have from the ghost tour that we took. What was the name of our tour guide again? I believe it was Matt. Yeah, and Matt was dressed up like a Confederate soldier. And so the clips that I'm going to be sharing are things that Matt was telling us while we were walking along doing the walking tour. And the first thing I want to play for you is just so that you know when... They tell the stories that they tell. It isn't like they're just pulling these out of thin air. Um, whenever I'm doing these presentations, there are questions that are often asked about these spectacular ones. Big ones that people want to know, are they real? Especially when asked by the very little ones when they look up and with big white eyes and go, are they real? Well, the stories I'm telling you this evening, they are documented. They're on file with the County Historical Society, our police department, and our local newspaper, St. Augustine Record. So as you heard there, all of the stories are well documented, particularly the ones that we're going to share with you this evening. And this one is very well documented. While many spirits may be hanging around this location due to its proximity to the Castillo and cemeteries, there is one spirit in particular that is reported to haunt the gates. In 1821, a devastating yellow fever epidemic hit the city, killing hundreds of people. Yellow fever is an acute viral disease that is spread by mosquitoes. It causes flu-like symptoms, and if it worsens, it attacks the kidneys and the liver, causing people to have yellow skin, thus it's called yellow fever for those of you who may not know what that is. One of the first people to catch the horrible disease was a 14-year-old girl named Elizabeth. Now, (laughs) I was complaining to Denise again about this last evening as we were doing our research, and you'll hear me do it all the time, is unfortunately in this line of research, it is so hard to get the truth. And really, when it comes to any kind of history, it's hard to get the truth. Uh, Things go missing, papers get burned, legends get started, things get twisted. It's almost like playing that game phone where you go around and everybody, Mm. you know, tries to spread a message. And by the time you get to the end, it's totally changed. So there are different stories about Elizabeth. In some of them, she does not have a name. In some of them, she has family and others. She's just dumped off at a cemetery and has nobody who claims her. We're going to go with a story that we think fits her the best and what we think is probably the reality of it based on the fact that she does hang out at the city gate. And that is that her father was a guard at the city gate and she loved to join him as he stood watch so she could wave to and greet the people there. Upon her death, she was buried at the Huguenot Cemetery, which sits just outside the city wall. We will be talking about that in just a moment. She is sometimes seen dancing in the cemetery, but most times is seen keeping her post at the city gate after midnight. People report seeing the young girl waving, but it's not known if she is welcoming visitors or warning them perhaps to stay away because of the yellow fever epidemic, which is kind of an indication to me that this is maybe residual. Possibly residual. So anyway, kind of piggybacking off of that, Diane and I were strolling down St. George Street when we decided to go into a neat little shop by the name of Fox Paws, located at 4 St. George Street. Dogs were welcome and we had our furry producer Rafiki with us. So we decided to check out the inventory, which consists of a lot of dog collections and figurines and gifts. 
And just stay with me. I really haven't gone off on a shopping spurt again. This does have a point. Uh huh. Uh huh. First of all, we purchased a couple of items, and I will say Diane is the one who kind of got those. Just kind of in my defense, I did, and I did pay for them. So I, I was cute. the one who was spending the money. One of them is we have a spoiled rotten Maltese lives here, which is very fitting for Rafiki. A little plaque and then a little shopping list. So anyway, we started a conversation with the owners, Lynn and Mark Small. They were a really great couple, and when we mentioned the podcast, Lynn took us next door to the St. George Inn. It was kind of funny. We just all left Mark in the shop, and we're like, bye, Mark. See ya. (laughs) Anyway, the inn wasn't only charming with absolutely beautiful accommodations, but it sits right in the heart of the City Gate Plaza with great views of the city. Lynn didn't take us there to show us the inn. She wanted us to see a picture that was taken right outside of the inn during a ghost tour. The picture was very amazing, and we were both left believing that the picture was the real deal. The picture was taken while the tour guide was telling a story. The guide is holding a mug, and it almost seems as though an orange-colored mist is rising from the mug that ends in a ball of light or an orb at the guide's head. And this one isn't just a typical dust orb like you might have seen, because there's a face in the orb. And the really, really cool thing about that face, I've seen orbs before where they're like, can you see the face in it? And you're like, okay, if you look at these shadows, those might be eyes. And if you pixelate it a lot, it might be this. And so you're like, okay, I guess if I look at it from the right, it looks a little bit like a face. Well, the face in this orb was as clear as one of those three dimensional, like, ultrasounds they do um, of babies, like where you can totally see the baby. And it was a face and it was the profile of a young girl. And so what we were wondering is, is had that the person who took the picture of the guide actually captured the face of Elizabeth. Yeah. And the really cool thing about the picture and what's kind of a bummer is I know if you ask any paranormal investigators, one of the things that they like to have happen when they're doing their investigations is to have evidence back up each other. So what I mean by that is, say, you take a picture, Denise, and you get what looks like an apparition, and then maybe I'm standing there with an EMF or I have a, a recorder or something. If I pick up a voice or some e- EMF type stuff at the same time as you're taking the picture, they kind of back each other up and verify, yeah, something anomalous is happening here. Whether it's a ghost or not, we don't know, but there's something happening here that it's kind of like when you have two eyewitnesses to something, it also, you know, Like the story I tell about my sister and I hearing the dog in the the kitchen, it helps to back up that story because there's two of us that heard it separate of each other. And so in this picture, you can see the people who are standing around the tour guide have EMF detectors in their hands. And I would love to know at the moment that that picture was taken, were they getting anything registering on their EMF detectors? Exactly. And and that is the thing, because just even when you look at the um, probability of history, it's eyewitnesses and the more things you have to collaborate it, because you can't prove history factually, or I mean, sorry, scientifically. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so, so it's always that eyewitness. So it would be nice just with that picture to know like what else was going on at that moment. Yeah, but I've never seen anything like this. It is, it's the only time that I've seen a picture of an apparition where there's, I I don't see any way that it could have been Photoshop, number one. And I've never seen anything that clear. There are many, you know, we've talked about on other shows where I've said, well, maybe if I use my imagination, that could be an eye socket. Maybe that's, there's no doubt. And it's, and the reason why we say it was so clear too is, you can tell it's a young girl because the way she's positioned, you would almost think if you had enough streaking in it that the tour guide, it was a double exposure and that the tour guide had been looking towards one side and then turned her head forward. And so you were getting a double exposure of this, her profile along with the front of her head because the orb is about at that same height. But there's absolutely no way that this is the tour guide's face because it's the, you know, the smaller child nose. And so it's, it's an amazing photo. I'm glad she took us over to look at it. Absolutely. So see, sometimes when I wander into shops, it's for a good thing. And as Denise was pointing out, the uh, St. George Inn, it's, it's funny because we've walked past it many times and I had no idea that there was this beautiful inn there because a lot of the bed and breakfasts are standalone houses The St. George Inn is just part of this area where all these shops are in. And it only has, on the one side, it looks like it just has half the building and there's just a little sign hanging out of it. So I didn't even know that this inn was there. And you walk in and it just has these gorgeous rooms and it's all around this plaza courtyard type area that's really neat. And so uh, it is a little bit more 
on the pricey side. So you're looking at anywhere between 150 to about $300 a night, depending upon whatever room you get. But I don't know, I would think it'd be worth the splurge just for the views and everything. And we did, of course, do our duty and ask the people who were there that evening, uh, do you, is this place haunted? And uh, she said they did have one room. I can't remember if she said it was like room 33 or 36, yeah, something like that. I can't like remember that. the number. I can't remember. But she said they have had a couple of times that people have mentioned that they've heard noises in there and, and had some weird disturbances. But she said, pretty much no, nothing's really happened. And there was another guy who was standing there with her that works there. And they both made the comment that, well, we haven't been here long enough. And at first I thought they were talking about maybe they hadn't worked there. To hear the stories. Exactly. Yeah. Long enough to know. And then as they continued on, I realized they were talking about the building because she's like, the building's only been here for 12 years. And Denise and I just kind of looked at each other and smiled because a lot of people are under that impression that a building, number one, has to be old to be haunted, which is not true. It could be a brand new house and be haunted. And why would that be the case, Denise? Because a lot of times it's the haunting is coming from like the graveyard or what it's built on top of, which in St. Augustine, pretty much if you build in St. Augustine, you're probably building on top of bodies. <laughs> More than likely. And I mean, this is right at, since I said we were specifically paying attention to the city gate and the cemeteries, everything that's just in this little itty bitty, I don't even know that the area that we're covering here is mm, maybe a city block altogether if you included everything because the cemetery is not real big either and then going across the street over to the castillo we'll talk about how that's an unmarked area over there but we don't know was this wall maybe a little bit further back too or who knows so i'm like well where you guys are sitting with this store i'm surprised they don't have ghosts crawling out of mm. everywhere nope just everybody else in costume who knows one of those might have really been a ghost and we just thought they were in costume. Yeah. <laughs> lynn didn't tell us she took us over to meet a couple of real ghosts <laughs> So that's a little bit about Elizabeth. It's definitely a story you will hear on every single ghost tour that you do there. I don't know. I think we're pretty fortunate to have seen a picture of her. Right. And well, and the other cool thing, though, like you said, that's the story you might hear on every one. But I'm amazed that we've done three different tours. I, of course, it is claimed to be one of the most haunted cities or the most haunted in the United States. And so but we hear different stories every time we go because pretty much every building has one. Now, the cemetery that is located right there is the one that Elizabeth's buried in, and it's called the Huguenot Cemetery. But before I talk about that, I do want to mention there is one other main cemetery that's in the same vicinity too, but not right there. So we're not going to get into talking about it this evening, but it's the Tolomato Cemetery. And this was the Catholic cemetery. It was basically the only cemetery that they had when the city first got established because obviously Catholicism was the main religion there. But they had Protestants who were coming in. But, you know, if you're not Catholic, you can't be buried in a Catholic cemetery, which is why the Huguenot Cemetery ended up being built. I wanted to touch on that because it was the first stop that we had on our ghost tour. And I did want to play a little clip about that because our tour guide, Matt, had a, something interesting to tell, particularly a group of girls on the tour with us, something about the ghosts in that cemetery. Well, uh, the guys, anyway. Will they push her? Well, I can tell you that um, we had a tour guide here who made the mistake of turning her back to the cemetery. She was at the front entrance over there. And she was talking with some people, turned her back, and then was pulled against the fence shaken violently. Something grabbed her, shook her violently, and the very next day, the bruises were very evident on her arms and wrists. Quite strong. Uh, I've seen images from behind these fences that have uh, yellow, red, and orange streaks, like the flames of hell. <laughs> yeah, nice, nice place, nice visit. Um, people with Native American ancestry, particularly Cherokee uh, background, they have been known to become physically ill simply by being around here. Native Americans seem to have a, an awareness of this spot more than others. I, I'm told that the Timbiquans and the Cherokees are often at loggerheads with one another, which could be a possible explanation as to why that would occur. Now, as for myself, I have some Spanish in my background, and it is the Spanish who are largely responsible for the fact that the Timbiquan are all dead. And I think they know that part about me, and they kind of bother me a little bit about it sometimes. <laughs> this is not a place I'm too fond of. It kind of freaks me out. During the daytime, I am literally walking across the street 
far from this place. Right now they seem to be quiet. Hopefully the presence of all the other people hanging around tonight will keep them at bay. Uh, the other thing I do want to mention, just one last thing before we start walking along again, that same individual and I, we were here one evening looking forward. Yeah, we know better than to turn our backs on this. We're looking forward and we could see these, a shadow, human size, draping itself across the mausoleum back there. And the two of us just kind of went, check please, and got on out of here. Now, you are perfectly welcome to come back and explore the uh, cemetery later if you like. We're going to be coming back around this way anyway, uh, a little bit later. And you're welcome to hang around here, take some pictures, take a, you know, a few questions. Just don't say I didn't warn you about the place. So, needless to say, we learned uh, don't turn your back on the cemetery. Yeah, which... um. That was a different because we'd also heard the um, story the on a different tour about the little boy. There's a little boy that climbs the tree right there in the in the cemetery. The Tomo, how do you say it again? Tomo Tolomato. Yeah, in the Tolomato Cemetery. And um, the the interesting too. We went back the next day because Matt invited us back, as you heard on the clip, to to take, come back and take pictures and visit. You can't go into the cemetery. We want to go back sometime. It's only open the third Saturday of the month. Yeah, that's the unfortunate thing. And I don't know if it's because they are worried about people damaging the cemeteries, but they're not open really for walking through. It's, I think both of them are only open like one day a month. And so you have to hit it just right. Yeah, but we went back to take pictures and I, my camera lens doesn't, it's, it has one of those chain link fences around it. My camera lens doesn't go through that, so it likes to focus on the the wire of the fence. So I climbed up on the little wall so I could take a picture over the fence. And I was a little bit nervous, I will say, standing that close to the fence on the wall, you know, afraid that I might get grabbed or knocked off because um, Matt's words were still ringing a little bit loudly in my ears. At least you were facing forward, so I I think you were safe then. But I, I mean, I was standing behind you just in case something did decide to push you. Oh, that's why you were so close? Well, I was... I. Was just a little bit worried. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the Tolomato Cemetery. But the one that we want to make sure we focus on this evening, because it's in this specific area right outside the old city gate, is the Huguenot Cemetery. The same year that yellow fever erupted in St. Augustine, the Huguenot Cemetery was established, and it was the public burial ground. Don't you love how it's called the public burial ground instead of just the Protestant burial ground? It's like, here's the Catholic cemetery and then here's the public burial there were already catholic cemeteries but the protestants needed a place so this half acre area was set aside for them it would take on the name huguenot which it was not named originally at a later date it was named for the 16th century french huguenots which you guys are probably going wow that name sounds kind of familiar they were massacred by the man who established saint augustine menendez there were so many deaths due to yellow fever that one whole section of the cemetery has no headstones because It is a mass burial. Indeed, which is very unfortunate. But when you have that many people dying so quickly, you just, you don't have time. And really, you've got to get rid of the bodies because they're contaminated. And the thing, and they could never go back later to find the bodies because you just had bones upon bones upon bones. And it wasn't real apparent of which bones went together to be able to find because they didn't have all the stuff that we have now. So Exactly. Burials continued from 1821 until 1884. And then the cemetery fell into a period of neglect. It was shut down. No more people were buried there. In 1946, citizens of St. Augustine decided to clean up and restore the old cemetery. And maintenance has continued to the present under the Friends of the Huguenot Cemetery. As is the case with many cemeteries, Huguenot spirits are not completely at rest. As mentioned earlier, Elizabeth is sometimes seen dancing among the headstones. Unexplained faces and shadows and lights appear in pictures, and sometimes voices can be heard along with the giggling of children. John Hall, John Lyman, and Erastus Nye were three men who died in 1835 at nearly the same time, and so they were buried side by side in the cemetery with similar headstones. In life, the men had been mischievous, which probably explains why they died, and those pranksters' ways have continued into the afterlife. The spirits of men are blamed for people being pushed, hats being knocked off, and women's skirts flying up. As for us, Diane was trying to take some pictures of Nye's headstone the night we were on the ghost tour, 
and it was the only time that she could not get the camera to operate properly. It could have just been a coincidence because we did go back the next day during the day and you were able to get pictures, but I had put the camera setting on a setting that would keep the shutter open a little bit longer because, you know, we didn't want to use our flash and stuff. So I don't know if it was something to do with the lighting and the shutter speed. But every time I tried to, I could take a picture of every other headstone near it. And at first I thought, okay, well, maybe it's the way I have it angled because there's a, what what would you call it? Like an iron, like a wrought iron, wrought wrought iron fence around the cemetery on the one side. And so I had the camera, I was trying to take a picture kind of over the top of it, but there's these, you know, little decorative things at the top. And I thought, well, maybe it somehow is trying to focus on one of those the way I have it tilted in order to try to get the gravestone. So maybe that's the issue. So I waited till the tour guide was done talking. And then as everybody started walking away, I kind of ducked down so that I could take a picture through the wrought iron bars towards the bottom. And I still could not take the picture And there was another guy with his girlfriend or wife, another couple, I'll say. He was trying to take pictures, too. And I saw that his flash kept, like, clicking, but there was no pictures going. You you know how a flash, like, blinks when it's getting ready to take a picture and then all of a sudden it'll flash? Well, it just kept doing the blinking thing. And I heard him talking to the woman that was with him, and he kept saying, I can't take a picture here to save my life. He goes, I cannot get a picture. So then after I tried to get a picture of the headstone, I went up to him and I said, I cannot get this camera to take a picture of that headstone for anything. So I don't know. Might have just been a coincidence or Nye is supposed to be the most prankster-ish, if that's a word, of the trio. So I don't know if he was pulling a prank and wouldn't let us take a picture of his tombstone. I'm not sure. Well, it could be because the next morning when we came back, I got pictures, but he might have been sleeping if he'd been up doing pranks all night. (laughs) Very true. Very true. Just saying. The most famous ghost that haunts the Huguenot Cemetery belongs to that of Judge John B. Stickney. And his tombstone is very prominent. You can't miss it. It's one of the nicest looking ones there. And it says Stickney right across the bottom of it. It looks kind of like a chess piece. I shouldn't say this, but thank you, Captain Obvious. (laughs) Stickney's dead phone says Stickney on it, so you can't miss it. (laughs) Okay, peanut gallery, you can be quiet now. Judge Stickney was born in Massachusetts in 1833 and moved to St. Augustine after the Civil War ended. He worked in St. Augustine as a state and district attorney and as a judge advocate. He was well liked by the people of St. Augustine and was mourned by them all when he passed away. The judge had been appointed as U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Florida and he had to travel to Washington, D.C. on business in 1882. Unfortunately, the judge was not feeling well. As he traveled, he became sicker and sicker as typhoid fever ravaged his body. The judge was dead within the week, and his body was shipped from D.C. back to St. Augustine, where he was laid to rest, but not for long. In 1903, Judge Stinkney's children had his body dug up and moved to D.C. to be reburied closer to them. So in the process of digging up the grave, the judge's gold teeth went missing more than likely stolen by grave robbers when the grave digger wasn't paying attention. We're not sure if he fell asleep, if he was drunk, whatever the case may be, some grave robbers came in and took the teeth from the skull. Apparently the judge was quite attached to those gold teeth, and although his body was moved, his spirit still hangs out at the cemetery. People claim to see a tall, dark figure that resembles Judge Stickney wandering the grounds of the cemetery as he searches for his missing teeth, or... Maybe he is looking for the men who stole his teeth. So, I mean, I know they see him, but how do they know he's looking for his teeth and not just hanging out because he loves St. Augustine? You know, I ask these questions all the time because unless he's wandering around going, you know, kind of like the zombies. Teeth! (laughs) Zombies looking for brains. Exactly. (laughs) And I haven't heard anybody say he's wandering around. Now, maybe people have picked up EVPs of him mentioning his teeth. I don't know. Oh, that that could be. But I was just laughing. I'm like, how do they know he's looking for teeth? He could be looking for anything. He might have dropped his watch. (laughs) Could be looking for... And here's the thing. If you're dead and you're a ghost, does it matter if you have teeth or not? I don't know. Maybe... And here's another good question. You know, these inquiring minds want to know. You know, ghosts appear at different stages of their life sometimes. So I've heard people wonder, do you get to pick? You know, if you die as an old woman, you probably would rather come back as your hot 30-something person that you used to be. Right? Maybe, or maybe you liked all your wrinkles and gray hairs. You never know. Yeah, that would not be me. No, <laughs> it definitely would not be you. So I'm thinking if you, if, if you get to choose how you come back as a ghost, uh, I'm thinking you're not coming back as the one who still needed his gold teeth. Maybe you'd be a younger version, didn't still had your original teeth. 
I don't know. But as a judge, he was successful, and there was a lot of neat things about that. And, and he was so well-loved in the city for being a judge, you know, so he might like his elder self. Though. And here's an even better question, Uh-oh. as we all ask. How do they know it's the judge? It could be some other guy hanging out. It could be one of the grave robbers looking for more teeth. <laughs> you don't, you never know. Or maybe it was the grave digger and he's looking for the teeth so he doesn't get busted for doing a bad job. Oh, there you go. So <laughs> <laughs> we just made this legend into all kinds of stuff. And that's how rumors start. <laughs> Speaking of which, you know, on a previous show, we had wondered why usually when you see a ghost, it's an older ghost talking about time wise, like a Victorian ghost or a ghost from the 20s or the 30s or the 40s, blah, blah, blah. But you don't you don't normally see a a parachute pants wearing ghost. Well, we heard something terrifying this evening when we were on this ghost tour that I'm going to share here that kind of takes us back to the parachute pants. Are are you ready? I'm ready. So doesn't that take you back to the 80s, Purple Rain? <laughs> yes, but please nobody think that, as far as we know, Prince is still among us. So if you see him, he is not a ghost. <laughs> and that was not an EVP. We were walking past a bar. And I mean, I was just the minute I heard that and I knew I had it recorded, I thought, oh, this takes me back to the, oh, that ghost is wearing parachute pants. Now that's <laughs> terrifying. So a bar full of people singing Purple Rain. Equally terrifying. On a Saturday night in St. Augustine, Florida. (laughs) Okay, so let's get back to the real show here. So across the road from the Huguenot Cemetery and outside of the Castillo is a large park-like area that's all covered in grass. It's thought that that area is a large unmarked graveyard, yet another place where hundreds that died of yellow fever were dumped in mass graves. And such a scene like that reminds one of the Black Death. Absolutely. And I want to go ahead and share a clip of Matt talking about this area as well, because he explains it a lot better than we do. They usually don't talk about it, and it's not because they're not allowed to talk about it. They generally don't talk about it. There's not much discussion. Perhaps around it, we're going to talk about the hillside, flat terrain. This is known as the glossus. This is not a naturally occurring hillside. This was actually built by the Spanish, using employed labor and slave labor. The idea was to create a bushfire. Any enemy attacking forces trying to make their way up this hill, well, they're going to get cut down by absolutely murderous gunfire coming from the fort. So this was a very tight defense. The British, they never really attempted storming the fort off the closest they got was they dug some trenches about 100, 150 yards away from them. As a result, there really weren't a lot of combat casualties here at the Castillo de San Marcos. However, back in the day, there's any one of a number of things that can kill a whole bunch of people. Like fire, famine, flood, disease. And you wind up with a whole lot of bodies to bury. And when you have a whole lot of bodies to bury, you need a big wide open area in which to bury the bodies. And where do you see the nearest large wide open patch of ground? Mm-hmm. You are now standing right on top of St. Augustine's biggest unmarked graveyard. So when we talk about the glosses being man-made, yeah, we mean it literally, people. So yeah, that, that grass there is man-made, Denise. Absolutely, in the hill as well. I mean, that's just, it's just amazing what the cities used to go through back in older times and the mass. Like, I don't think we could even conceive what that would be like to be in a city with that mu- that many bodies and what to do with them. Exactly. And I do want to remind people, as I said earlier, I do apologize for the audio because there was a lot of outside noise. So uh, in the background... It sounds like something is mumbling, or I believe it's just music that's coming in from a bar that was across the street. Yeah, so that's not a ghost. If anybody's like, whoa, 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 you got something. (laughs) I'm hearing some weird stuff. Or the children in the background. Again, there were kids that were running around the Castillo in the middle of the night. I don't know why, but so anything that you're hearing in the background, 
Uh, we might have picked up EVPs, but there would be no way we would ever know because there was just so much contamination from other noise. Yeah, and there was a lot of spirits of the other time uh, of the other type flowing freely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There definitely was. So death seems to permeate the area outside the gate, and now the spirits do as well. Or do they? That is for you to decide. So this was just one little area that we uh, were focusing on. Of course, we've done the Ripley's Auditorium, which had lights on it as well for the holiday season. So that was very cool. We took some pictures there. Before we finish up everything here, I do have a couple of other audio bites that I did want to play from our tour. One of them was talking about some ghost dogs. And then another one is talking about some ghosts that hang out at the White Lion restaurant. Well, that's the kind of thing that people would do with the dogs right there. They'd reach out to give them that pot on the forehead or the scratch under the chin. And then their hands go right through the dog's heads. A pair of ghostly white standard poodles in that building. Now, in as much as they were seen very often in there, they have not been seen in a very long while since. And I think I kind of know why. And take a moment and look at things from the dog's point of view. From a person's point of view, and going through a dog's head, you know, I would think a person would probably find that to be at least a little frightening. However, I would think that the dogs, they would find that to be extremely annoying. I know that would bother me. Hands always going through my head. It's a terrible violation of my privacy. Because after all, what's up here belongs to me. One of the other questions I get asked is that why do the dead only come out at night? Why do we only see the ghosts? Well, they're not, it's not so much a matter of them only coming out at night. They're always around. The thing is, is that those who are dead have a very low energy level. When we're awake, we're walking all over. When we're asleep, their energy levels have a chance to rise. And I bring this up, kind of ties in with something we got going on over here. This is the White Lion Restaurant. It's a nice place to eat. I've eaten here myself from time to time. And um, we have gotten some reports in the past about some ghosts that haven't seen in the kitchen of the White Lion. Yeah, they're hanging out right there in the morning, just before the place opens up. Now, what do you suppose those ghosts are doing in the kitchen of the White Lion? Anyone have any suggestions? Snacking. No? Anyone else? No? Close. They're actually cleaning. Cleaning up the pots, the pans, the dishes, the well, that'd be nice. Getting cleaning up last night's business and getting the place ready for the next day. This usually prompts people on my walks to ask if they could take those ghosts home with them. Yeah, they could use the help in their own kitchens. Um, and but, you, but you know what the best part of this is? Labor laws in the USA only apply to the living, not the dead. You don't got to pay them anything. Free labor. So at the White Lion Inn, the thing we really like that Matt was talking about is that those ghosts do actually clean during the night. And um, so a lot of the people in our tour were saying, oh, we'll take those ghosts home. And I joined them until I was like, whoa, 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 don't tempt the spirits. (laughs) That's the main thing with Denise. Don't invite anything to come home with you. Be careful what you ask for. Exactly. They might be cleaning dishes for you one night and then rolling you out of your bed the next. And I don't like getting rolled out of my bed. And on our next show, I believe what we are going to do is go ahead and focus on the person that I had mentioned earlier, particularly because this is the month that commemorates his death. And that should probably give everybody a little hint. Let's see. Somebody in the music industry who died in the month of December. He was murdered. He was extremely, extremely popular both here and across the pond. And very talented. Died in the year 1980. Anybody getting it now? John Lennon. So on our next show, we will cover the life and the afterlife of John Lennon, because apparently he's been very active, even though he's been dead for, I think, 34 years now. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's been, I can't believe it's been that long. Yeah. So join us for the next show as we cover that. Make sure you send us any feedback that you'd like to at historygoesbump at gmail.com. Sign up for the newsletter. That's the best way to find out what upcoming events we have going on. And we will have one in January for those of you who are either going to be visiting the state of Florida or live in the state of Florida, particularly in the central Florida area. We will be going to the city of Mount Dora and doing a ghost tour there. It's a really neat city here in Florida. Got a really neat downtown area. It's one of my favorite downtown areas to hang around in. 
Oh, absolutely. That's close by. And so that's going to be a great time. So again, I'm putting that together right now. And um, we will have more information probably on our next show about that. And we'll again, want people to let me know so I can get it set up. But we will be doing a gathering and a meetup at um, a ghost tour just really close. Mount Dora from from like the Disney parks is about what, 45 minutes? Yeah, probably about 45 minutes. Yeah, so not quite as a drive as St. Augustine was. So hopefully a lot of you will be able to join us. And we do want to let you know as well that we will be having a show on Christmas. We're going to do a Christmas special. So if you have any stories that you would like to share that are either holiday themed or something that happened to you over the holiday season, we'd love to hear from you about those as well. We want to thank you for joining us this evening. I have been your host, Diane. And this is Denise. Take care now. Bye-bye. Check out the website at historygoesbump.com.